give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Thank you, worship team, for your hard work. We appreciate it. All right, so uh, tonight we're going to jump into the Old Testament. We cannot talk about the Bible without going back into the Old Testament. So um, there are 66 books in the Bible. 39 of them are in the Old Testament. That's about 60% just on a book uh, percentage. In this Bible right here, there are 1,042 pages. 803 are passages in the Old Testament. That's 77%. So if you're going to be a man or woman of Scripture, at some point you need to be reading the Old Testament. And so what I want to do tonight is sort of jump back uh, 440 years before Jesus was born. So we're going to go all the way back to the, day, the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. And just a little background information, Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. And in the Hebrew Bible, it's actually, they're actually the second to last book in the entire Old Testament. So in our English Bibles, it's the same amount of books, same, everything's the same, except in the Hebrew Bible, their Bible would put Ezra and Nehemiah at the end of the Old Testament. And here's why I think it's a, it's a really beautiful theological reason, because if you know the story that unfolds in the Old Testament, God desperately loves his people. And he wants to get his own people in his own land who will be under his own rule. And that's the theme. That's the entire theme of the Old Testament is that God will get his people home where they will dwell securely. Now, there's a problem that God uses the ministry of Moses to bring them out of bondage. He uses the ministry of Joshua to get them into the land. He uses the ministry of David to go to war against all of the neighboring kings and countries so that they will be in their own land. And there's a problem, and it's their own sin, that when they get in God's land, they want the land, but they do not want the law. They want God's provision, but they don't want to follow him. And so God sends prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, and they're all preaching the same message. Your God is faithful. Repent. Turn from your sins. And they did not. And so in the days of Solomon, the kingdom started to fracture into two, the north and the south. And the northern tribes were carried off by the Assyrian army, who was a world power at the day. And then several years later, the southern tribes were carried off by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and they were taken into Babylon. And that's when you read the book of Daniel, Daniel is living in exile. He is living outside of the promised land, but God is faithful. And God says, I will bring you back, and I will bring you back into my land where you will dwell with me. I will not always be angry with you. And so God raises up a man by the name of Zerubbabel. He raises up another man by the name of Ezra. And finally, he raises up another man by the name of Nehemiah. And they go in three different ways to go back and rebuild the city, to go back and rebuild the altar, to go back and rebuild the temple, and to go back and rebuild the wall. And if you were reading your Old Testament from a Jewish lens, that's where your Old Testament would end. It would end right there with God's people in God's land. And so that's what we're going to read. And so I want to tell you a little, bit, a little bit about Nehemiah. He was the cupbearer to the king, which means... He got to eat steak and shrimp and lobster and really good wine, and he got to taste it before the king ate it. Why? Because they didn't have guns, and the, and the way that you would assassinate a king would be to poison his food. And so what the kings would do is that they would get cupbearers who would live in living quarters near them, who would sample every single thing that was served to them. And this was a really high calling because Nehemiah was a Jew. And he had, in essence, became the second in command. And so Nehemiah is in Susa, which is the vacation city where the kings went in the winter. And he hears about what's going on in Jerusalem. He hears that, hey, I'm eating steak and shrimp and lobster, dwelling in a fortified city, the city where the kings parlay all day. And over here in Jerusalem, my people are suffering. And so he has this bright idea. He says, just maybe I can go and honor the Lord. 
just maybe God can use me to go back and to help rebuild. And so he makes this thousand mile journey from Susa through Babylon all the way back to Jerusalem without a car, without trains. He had horses and he iked and miked it, right? That's his feet, right? And he finally made it. If God is for him, this is going to be a piece of cake, right? If God's going to get him back, this is going to be easy, right? Let's read our text. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 9. And then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. And so Artaxerxes had divided the entire, his entire kingdom into provinces. And so when he says the province beyond the river, he's talking about the Euphrates River. And so the province beyond the river would have been the territory where Jerusalem was. So Nehemiah basically says, hey, I made it across the Euphrates River into the the broader land where Jerusalem is, and I handed out the king's letters. I'm in verse 9 again. And now the king has sent with me officers of the army and of horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And that word right there, welfare, it, it's, it's the good of Israel. And that theme keeps coming up. And so I went to Jerusalem and was there for three days. And then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by the night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates had been destroyed by fire. And then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. So Nehemiah is reporting about how badly disfigured and dismantled Jerusalem is. And then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, do you see the trouble that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates are burned with fire? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been, up, had been upon me for good. That's that same word again. And also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work, that word again. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and they despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants, we will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, we ask a simple request right now. Would you arrest our affections? Would you speak through your servant that we would love you more on account of hearing and understanding your word? May you forgive my own sins and may you bind the evil one. And may you make a way out of no way and make you exalt, may you exalt yourself right now for Christ's sake. Amen. All right, so have you ever wanted to do good for the Lord but realized that it was really, really hard? I mean, last night we talked about this amazing love of Jesus that washes you and cleanses you, cleanses you, that sees inside of you and knows all of that stuff in your heart and yet it stays. We talked about the way that this love of Christ, it transforms you, then you would necessarily think that, okay, man, if he loves me this much, then it's going to be easy for me to render obedience to him. Haven't you found it hard to have a consistent, quiet time? Haven't you found it hard to say no to your own sin? Haven't you been deceived and enticed into the ways and thinking of the world? Haven't you, would you agree with what Paul would say, that the the good that I desire to do, that when I try to do it, I find that there is a law, that there is evil close at hand? Believe it or not, Nehemiah encounters opposition 
that we face as soon as he steps foot in Jerusalem. You see it in, in, in verse 9. And then I came to the governor's province beyond the river, gave him the king's letters. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant, heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people. Do you see what he's saying? As soon as I touch down in Jerusalem, these two cats are already opposing me. They, they, they hate what I'm here to do. I talked about Jesus being the ultimate hero of Scripture a few days ago. For every hero has a villain, an enemy, who opposes him and opposes his people. Tonight, I want to talk about that villain and that enemy and that opposition that we feel. So what I, want, I want to ask a few questions. What are we up against? How deep is this opposition? And will it win? The first thing I want to show you is that there is a pattern of opposition in the entire Bible. Now, this, this, it might be tempting if you, don't, if you haven't read Ezra and Nehemiah to sort of assume that this opposition that he encounters is both random and it's both temporal. And what do I mean by that? It might be tempting to look over this and gloss past this and think that there is nothing to this. Oh, that's just Nehemiah. If, if someone else had gone or it had it been a different day or a different time, then maybe this would not have worked out that way. But here's what I want to prove to you. This is not haphazard. This was not restricted to the time in which Nehemiah lived. This is a definitive posture of opposition from the evil one that existed then, that exists right now, that will exist until Jesus comes back. Now, I'm going to give you some scriptures, but just, just kind of trust me on this. I've studied these two books for the past year. So um, I want to go back to Ezra, and I want to show you a pattern. That's all I want you to think right now. All right, Pastor L, show me a pattern, right? You're going to say that this, is, this opposition has a pattern to it. Show me. Let me start with Ezra. Zerubbabel comes back with the first wave of exiles in Ezra chapter 4 verse 1. If you want to write that down, you don't have to go there right now. And it says that as soon as they arrived, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard this. Chapter 4 verse 4 of Ezra. And then they came and discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid and bribed counselors against them. And they frustrated them all the days of Cyrus, all the days of Darius, all the days of Ahasuerus, and all the days of Artaxerxes. You hear what Ezra is saying? That Zerubbabel came, and as soon as he came and started rebuilding the temple, these cats from around them showed up, and they spent the next four kings trying to frustrate their work, trying to make them not rebuild this city. Then you switch gears. You switch gears from the Jews who left Babylon and went back at, uh, from the exile. You go to the book of Esther. And that is, that is looking at the Jews who decided not to go back to Jerusalem. Those are the ones who wanted to stay in Susa and stay in Babylon. And right in there, if you go to Esther chapter 3, verse 2, Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. And in Esther chapter 3, verse 4, Haman figures out that Mordecai is a Jew. And in Esther chapter 3, verse 6, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire kingdom. You fast forward back to Ezra, Ezra chapter 8, verse 22, Ezra calls a fast at the Ahava River when he decides to leave and he decides to go back and to teach the Israelites. And it says, let's fast for, because we need to be protected from the enemy along the way. And so now, Nehemiah, it's your turn. You're going to go. It's a new day. A new day, a new time, a new person, a new work. Just maybe, just maybe you can make it into Jerusalem and not face opposition. And as soon as he shows up in Jerusalem, these two cats come out of the woodworks. Look at what it says in verse 9. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard that I had come it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. 
And that word right there, welfare, it's the Hebrew word tov, which means good. And that's going to be so important later. Nehemiah is saying, I came to seek the good of God's city, the good of God's people. And how did they respond? They were greatly displeased. If you go to Nehemiah chapter 5, you'll understand how they were living. They were poor. They were selling their children. They were second mortgaging their fields. They were in debt above their heads. And Nehemiah comes to bring something good, to restore them to normal human dignity and decency. And when he says, I want to go and do good, that's when these two jokers decide that we're upset. We want you to suffer. We want you to starve. We want to keep your children. We want you to not have property. That is their posture towards Nehemiah and towards God's people. And so look at verse 18. And I told the people that the hand of my God had been upon me for good and all the words of the king. And they said, let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hand for the good work. And then look at verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us. What kind of men are we talking about here? They just want to eat. They just want to have their children. They just want the normal things that we would want. And these men, they hate that. They're against that. You see the pattern? The pattern is in Ezra and Nehemiah. Every single time God's people want to do something for him, they're met with opposition. And here's the case. That pattern is not just limited to Ezra and Nehemiah. You step back, that is the pattern of the Bible. Now, when you see that Tobiah was an Ammonite servant, we look at that and we say, okay, he was from Ammon, right? Okay, I get it. If a Jew were reading this and they saw the word Ammonite, it would trigger some hard memories. It would trigger some memories from Deuteronomy 23 when the Lord says, no Ammonite may ever enter the assembly of the Lord. Even until the 10th generation, none of them may enter my assembly forever because they did not meet you with bread or with water on the way when you came out of Egypt and because they hired Balaam, the false prophet, to curse you. And so the Ammonites, when Moses brought them out of the promised land, the Ammonites were not kind to God's people. They hire a false prophet to curse them. And God says, because of this, they will never, ever, ever enter into my assembly. So when a Jew hears that Tobiah is the Ammonite leader, you know what's going through their mind? Bro, a thousand years ago, they've been hating on us. A thousand years ago, when we tried to come into the land, they would give us no food. They wanted us dead. What kind of hostility is this? That's bigger than Ezra. That's bigger than Nehemiah. That's bigger than Moses. It goes all the way back to the garden. And it goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15 when the Lord tells Satan, I will put enmity between your offspring and her offspring. Well, what do you mean? Will the serpent have offspring or children? It is not a physical lineage but a spiritual one in which a human being can be a child of Satan by the will and by the heart and by the intention and by the affection who takes delight in the pain and suffering of God's people who takes delight in making what God wants to do good and wanting to make it ugly who takes delight in being a murderer from the beginning when God says everything that I've created is good who shows up on the scene in Genesis and tries to make everything ungood Satan and if you are a follower of Christ and you seek to honor and obey Christ, it is not a coincidence when it's hard. And it is not a coincidence when you're attacked. And it's not 
a coincidence when your faith is mocked. And it's not a coincidence when the church is persecuted. And it's not a coincidence when you're the one in the crowd and you're getting peer pressured by unbelievers who don't know God. They are trying to sabotage your faith. It is not a coincidence that one of my friends is planning a church in Camden and before the church launches, someone is murdered right on the doorstep of the church. It is not a coincidence when you get those direct messages from those people with fake accounts on Instagram and social media with a half-naked woman or a half-naked man. Do not think that that is a coincidence. That is the, the work of the demonic one behind the scenes through people. These profiles do not create themselves. Someone out there is creating this trash and they're alluring you in. Come on, baby, follow me, follow me, follow me. This is not a coincidence. There is all out war against you because there is a villain who hates you and he hates your Christ and he hates your gospel. C.S. Lewis in his book, Screwtape Letter, says one of the greatest tragedies of the human race is to disbelieve and dismiss the existence of the demonic. It's a great tragedy of the human race. We think it's all peaches and cream, and it's not. Now, how deep is this opposition? Do you see the pattern? The pattern in Ezra, the pattern in Nehemiah, the pattern in all of the Bible, and that pattern exists right now. How deep is it? To get at this, I want to sort of look at some of the names and think through the way Hebrews named. And so I, won't, I will not spend a lot of time, but just I'm going to read a few names and I want you to tell me what's the common two or th uh, three syllables. So Jeremiah, Isaiah, Nehemiah, Hakaliah, Hananiah. W what's the phrase? W what's the, I guess that's not a phrase. W what's the syllabus? What syllable, yeah, <laughs> syllable, syllable, right? So what's the same in all of those names? Aya. So Jeremiah means Yahweh exalts. Isaiah means Yahweh saves. Nehemiah means Yahweh comforts. Hekeliah means wait for Yahweh, and that's Nehemiah's dad's name. Hananiah is Nehemiah's brother, and it means Yahweh is gracious. Now, just stay right there for a minute. Like, just, just, just let that linger right there. You see these two men. The first guy's name is Sanballat, and it's an Akkadian name that literally means sin gives life. And sin was the name of the moon god. And so his name literally means that the moon is the author of life. No Hebrew would name their kid Saint Ballot. I mean, that's like us naming our kid heresy, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the weight of this guy's name. And so it's obvious right here that this guy does not ascribe glory. His parents, at least, did not think that Yahweh was the creator. They're naming their son. God is not the creator. But here's the one that gets me. Look at Tobiah. You notice something? The same ending as what other names that we just worked through? Nehemiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. The last few letters of his name means Yahweh. And you want to know what the first three letters of his name mean? Tob. Good. The same word that we see repeated three times in Nehemiah that God set me apart for the Tob, the good work. 
that we're going to do the good work. Here it is, this guy who's probably a Jew, and his name literally means Yahweh is good, and he is a snake. Now, we know he's a snake, one, because he is greatly displeased when anything good for God is happening. But, man, if you turned over to Nehemiah 13, you don't have to. Just write it down. Trust me on this. I'll read parts of it. Now, before this, Eliashib, the priest, oversaw a large chamber with a grain offering, the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of the grain and the wine and the oil were to be given to those who worked in the temple. And so if you worked in the temple, the frankincense, the, I mean, everything that the people gave, a portion of that was stored. And so the priests and the singers and the Levites, when they wanted to get food, they would go into the storeroom, and that was the way that they were compensated. But look at what Nehemiah says happened in Nehemiah 13. Tobiah, Tobiah, the same guy that we're looking at right here, you know what he did? He cut a side deal with the priest. He says, hey, priest, take all of that stuff that's set apart for the Lord, put it outside, and I want to turn this into my own man cave. And that's exactly what he did. He took all of God's stuff out of the temple and moved his own household furniture inside the temple. And Nehemiah got wind of it, and he threw it out. Do you see how deceptive and cunning this guy is? What does that say about you, that you would go into the holy places of God and put a flat screen TV? This explains why Nehemiah goes out during the night. This explains why he doesn't tell anybody what he's doing because he can't trust anybody. Do not underestimate the power of darkness. Do not underestimate the complex webs of opposition and who is behind it, Satan is. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sows good seed. But while his men are sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And then when the workers noticed that the wheat and the weeds had been growing together, they ran to the master. Master, you sowed good seeds. How is it that the weeds are growing? The master says, my enemy has done this. Then they say, well, shall we go and pull up the weeds? And the master says, no, let them grow together until harvest time. And at harvest time, my reapers will gather and separate them and burn them. This is how Jesus describes the kingdom. Seeds. Seed of the woman. Seed following him, living together with the seed of the serpent. And there is war going on right now in our lives and in our world where darkness wants you and it wants to sift you and it wants to sift your faith. And it's real. When I was in seminary, my dad is a believer now, and so when I was in seminary, we started a landscaping company because I had to write RTS a check for $1,100 every month, right? So my dad and I started a landscaping business, and I never weeded in my life. And so I would, I would oftentimes try to find little dudes in the neighborhood where I stayed and hire them and pay them, you know, a couple bucks an hour and just kind of bring them along with me. And so finally, I assigned, I said, hey, Ken, can you go pull those weeds out of those flower beds back there? He said, all right, I'll do it. And he forgot to do it. And so we came back like two weeks later, our normal sort of two-week return, and we had planted lantana. We had planted impatience. And do you know that they were destroyed? He did not take the weeds out, and there was a horticultural war right there in that flower bed because those weeds were taking sunlight. They were taking soil. They were taking moisture, and, and what we planted that was beautiful and good was withering and dying. And Jesus says, that's a picture of the kingdom. 
you got to know that it's weeds and it's opposition and satanic forces of evil out there warring against you. And sometimes they're like Sambalat. Well, you, the brother, I know your name tells me about you when you're coming. I know. And sometimes they're like Tobiah. They seem like they're good. But it's undercover hostility. C.S. Lewis also says the other error which is equally dangerous, is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in the demonic. Here's what he's saying. We need to appropriate it. We need to be aware of it. But we need to remember Satan will not win. And he does not have the last say-so. He is not stronger than your God. And as much as we see the pattern of opposition and the depth of opposition, as much as you feel that in your own heart and you see that in your own life, I want you to see something else. I want you to see the pattern of God's faithfulness. And that pattern is all in the scriptures. It's everywhere. As a matter of fact, they tried to stop Zerubbabel from building the temple. The temple got built. They tried to stop Ezra from making it into Jerusalem. He made it into Jerusalem. Haman tried to wipe the Jews off the face of the planet, and God says, Esther will be queen, and my people will be safe. Nehemiah wants to build the wall, and guess what? They're going to fight, and they're going to war, and guess what? The wall gets built in 52 days. Do you see the pattern that everywhere that darkness tries to put out the light, God says, you can't. You will not win. That is the testament of the scripture. It is the absolutely right way to read the scripture. There is opposition. But God wins. All the time. 100% of the time. And you see it in the text. Look at what Nehemiah is doing. When they're jeering, Geshem and Sanballat and Tobiah, they're poking fun at them. This is like three on one. You're here, you're here, you're here. I'm in the middle. And look at what he says in verse 20. Then I reply to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, we will arise and we will build. And brother, you have no portion with us. That word right there where God will make us prosper, it is a violent word. And it means God will make a way out of no way. It means that God will cut through a rock if he has to, but he will do what he has determined to do. And it does not matter if it's three of you. It does not matter if it's three million of you. You are not stronger than my God. And the people hear that and they are emboldened. Because the God of heaven will make a way. Haven't we seen this? The epitome of opposition. Do you not remember that when your Lord and Savior was born, that Herod tried to kill him? Do you not remember what Revelation 12 says, that there's an image of a woman giving birth and there's a dragon who tries to devour the child? It's a picture. It's a picture when God is doing something good, the demonic will show up. It's a, pic- it, it, it's a reason when Jesus was born, he was taken into the wilderness and he was tempted by the evil one. It's a reason that when the Lord of glory walked on the face of the earth, that the demonic and the oppressed and, and people struck with blindness and infirmities, they just kind of pop up on scripture out of nowhere. It's demonic activity that is real. But God is always one step ahead. He makes a way out of no way. He would use Judas to kiss and to betray Jesus. And John says Satan entered into him and he betrayed Jesus and handed him over to be crucified. And God says, checkmate. 
You got it. You just did exactly what I intended from the foundations of the world. Your evil will run you silly and stupid, and I will use this to save my people. He will make a way when it seems that there is no way. That's why Paul says his wisdom is above our wisdom. His ways is above our ways. That's why he's worthy to be worshipped. Because he gets the last say. And that's true for you. I don't care what you face in life. Your God says you're mine. Satan will not have the last say over you. You are mine forever and ever. And you're secure. Rest in me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you identify the struggle and the opposition. You, you show this us time and time again in Scripture. Give us eyes to see when darkness is at work. Give us faith to, to claim it as that. And give us faith to believe that you have triumphed over darkness on the cross. You have defeated him. You have triumphed over him in power. And a day is coming where you will put an end to Satan. He will be under your feet. And he will torment us no more. And we will see you and know you. And we will not fight with sin. And we will not struggle. There will be no one or nothing that will compete with our affection. Oh, God, give us faith to hold on for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you all.